Hello, and welcome to my latest video, where I explain how it's possible to short sell more than 100% of the GameStop free float legally. Now let's get to it. I've heard many people give their views on why it shouldn't be possible to have more than 100% of the free float sold short, that there must be something shady going on. So I thought I'd give you my perspective on it and why I think it's possible to have this happen. Remember, I'm just explaining how it can happen legally, not that I necessarily think it's a good idea. In fact, in my view, this looks like an overtraded short position, but that's a question of risk management, not whether it's possible to do it. I'm going to explain it using assumptions based on a small sample of real trading data from early March when this video is being recorded. And I'm hoping that by showing the animations, it will help get my points across better than just explaining it verbally. I thought I would start with some scene setting on the owners of GameStop. This information is taken from the GameStop website and it's based on public filing, so it's only accurate as at the filing date show. Nevertheless, I think it's a, probably a pretty reasonable representation of what it still looks like today. The owners listed here include mutual funds, ETFs, other institutional investors, and Ryan Cohen's vehicle you might also recognize some hedge funds as being significant shareholders, and this underscores a point I've made many times. Hedge funds can be long or short, and there's no question in my mind that with GameStop, there have been funds on both sides of the equation, and no doubt many funds have been actively trading the momentum of the action. In other words, while Wall Street bets may have popularized it and retail investors added to the frenzied activity, I don't really think this is a David versus Goliath story. As I said, I wanted to take you through an example, but try to make it representative of real activity. The GameStop public float is 54.49 million shares. I looked at nine trading sessions from March 2021 and the average traded volume in that period was 37 million shares a day. The average short selling volume over that same period was 8.6 million shares, which represents 23% of the typical daily turnover, and that's equivalent to 15% of the public float being shorted every day. Some more facts. Short sellers need to identify that there are shares available to borrow before they can do a short sale. Now, they don't actually need to borrow those shares right away. They just need to be reasonably confident that there are shares available. There are regulatory requirements about evidencing that confidence, and there have been fines doled out for failures to account for locates correctly. So the first step is to locate, then sell short, then borrow the shares. Short sellers borrow from a wide array of institutional investors, such as mutual funds and ETFs, who I just described as being important shareholders on the GameStop owners list. Approximately 35% of the $2.75 trillion of securities that are on loan on a daily basis come from mutual funds and ETFs, and a further 25% come from pension funds. So this represents a huge revenue stream for these funds and the investors, uh, future pensioners and existing pensioners that benefit from those lending fees. The figure is about $10 billion a year in fees for lenders. And in February 2021, investors earned $812 million in fees just that month. And of course, February is a short month. In January, lenders earned $41 million just that month, just lending out GameStop shares. So you can see it's pretty lucrative. Okay, 
So here's my hypothetical situation will be the basis for the rest of the presentation. We start off with 100 shares in the public float, and that's convenient because we'll also call that 100% of the public float. At the start, there are four investor groups, mutual funds, ETFs, institutional investors, and retail investors, each of whom hold 25 shares for a total of 100 real shares. On trading day one, a short seller wants to short 15 shares, which is 15% of the free float. And remember, that was the average turnover in real life for the period I was talking about in March. As I said earlier, the short seller has to locate a lender before they can do a short sale. So the trader, in this case, asks whether anyone will lend them GameStop stock. An institutional investor says they have the stock and are willing to lend it in order to earn extra income while still getting the economic benefits of being a GameStop investor. Just a quick explanation of what happens when a stock loan uh, occurs. Uh, in the last slide, we saw that the institutional investors say that they were willing to lend 15 shares to the short seller. The lender is holding their shares at their custodian bank or broker, and they deliver 15 shares to the borrower. In order to protect themselves, they take collateral from the borrower. For U.S. stocks, the collateral is usually U.S. dollars, and they typically take cash that's worth 2% more than the value of the stock they've loaned out. They take the collateral to protect themselves in the event of a borrower default, as happened with Lehman Brothers. They take the extra 2% to cover price fluctuations, and every day they revalue the stock and make certain they always have the 2% excess margin. Now, when the short seller receives the 15 shares from the lender, they deliver them to whomever bought the shares in the market. Now, if you dig into the plumbing of this, this isn't actually exactly what happens, but that is the net outcome of it. The rest of it is just kind of plumbing behind the scenes. At the end of trading day one, the hedge fund has sold the stock short, borrowed the shares, and delivered it to the buyers. The buyers, of course, are likely to be from the same pool as the lenders. So in this example, the 15 shares gets bought with five shares going to mutual funds, who now have 30 shares, five by retail investors, who also hold 30 shares, and five shares by institutional investors, who hold 30 shares themselves, with the ETF still with their original 25 share position. That institutional investor started the day with 25 real shares they were actually holding. They lent 15 to the short seller, so at that stage they only had 10 shares in their hands. And when they bought the other five shares in their hands, which happens to, in this case, be coming from the short seller, they receive another five real shares. So their custodian is holding 15 shares, and they're owed a further 15 shares by the short seller. Now, interestingly, the short seller has delivered them five shares, which they loaned out to the borrower in the first place. The total economic interest across all the investors is for 115 shares, but there are only 100 real shares. So the short seller is responsible for the economic impact of the other 15 shares. And as a result of that, that still leaves an overall net position in the market of 100 shares. For trading day two, the short seller again wants to do another 15% of the free float, and that's still 15 shares, and legally has to find the shares as previously described. This time, the ETF investor agrees to lend shares to earn the money. Just as an aside, securities lending revenues are important to many ETFs, which use the income to either reduce the operating expenses or to improve performance and track the target index more effectively.
at the end of trading day two, the hedge fund has sold another uh, 15 shares short for a total of 30 shares, and that's 30% of the free float. The buyers of the 15 shares this day are the ETFs, retail investors, and institutional investors, each buying five shares. The ETF loaned out the stock, so they have a traded position of 30, with 15 in their custody, and 15 owed to it by the short seller. And so we still have a net position of 100 shares with investors legally entitled to the economic performance and benefits of 130 shares, which in itself are made up of 100 real shares and 30 shares the short seller is responsible to provide. Now, I'm going to fast forward, uh, applying that same criteria until we get to trading day 10. Remember that I'm using the 15% free float, uh, which is a real figure uh, from March. And in my example, I just keep rotating who the buyers are across my four groups. Now, it might seem unnecessary, but I'm just going to remind everyone that for every short sale, there's a buyer. And many of those buyers are also lenders. And where the buyer is a lender, when they get their hands on real shares being delivered to them, they have the potential to lend them out again. Now, I've obviously massively simplified the entire process because in reality, the short selling volume fluctuates due to numerous variables. Some short positions get closed out, other new ones open up. There are days where there are short selling restrictions because of price movements. There are days when investors sell their holdings and ask for their stocks back. Anyway, as I said, there's numerous variables. But look, I've ignored all of that so we can focus just on this central issue. How do you legally get to 140% of the GameStop free float short sold? Now, the short seller has been continuously selling 15 shares a day, each day for 10 days. The investors keep lending because they like to keep earning the fees for their shareholders and investors. And so here we have it. We're at the end of trading day 10. The short seller has now borrowed and short sold 150 shares of GameStop. The various lenders only have a few shares sitting in their custody accounts. Most of their holdings are owed to them by the short sellers who borrowed the stock. Now, it's important for you to recognize that I've lumped together all of the mutual funds into one group and all of the ETFs into another group and all the pension funds together and so on. So these positions look really extreme when they're considered uh, in these sort of aggregate lumps. But in reality, there are also other investor types that lend, such as sovereign wealth funds, and as well as the brokers that are providing margin, margin lending to their customers. So, for example, according to ETF.com, 63 different ETFs hold GameStop, and altogether they own over 10 million shares. Now, I don't know how many of those ETFs are lending their GameStop shares, but I think it's pretty safe to say there's more than one. Here are the closing positions at the end of our 10-day period. We started with a free float of 100 shares and ended up with investors expecting to get the economic performance of 250 shares. There are still only 100 real shares, and short sellers have contractual obligations to return the other 150 borrowed shares to the lenders, and while the shares are borrowed, to provide the ongoing economic benefits to the original lenders and investors. So, there you have it. That's how you get to 140%, or in this case more, of the free float sold short and how it can be done legally and how real shares can actually move in the market to satisfy the daily trading settlement obligations. But of course, this throws up all kinds of questions. Here are just a few, and I may answer these uh, and more questions in upcoming videos. As I've said, there are only 100 real shares and the short sellers required to make 
the lender whole economically for the other borrowed amount, the 150 shares. So for example, if GameStop declared a dividend, the company would only pay the 100 real shareholders with the short sellers on the hook for providing the cash equivalent to the lenders for the other 150 shares. If GameStop had an annual meeting and all the shares wanted to vote, their 250 shares were the votes, well, that wouldn't be possible because there are really only 100 real shares to go around. What would happen then? Well, look, that's definitely a topic for another day. And at some point in future, the short seller needs to buy 100 sh 150 shares to give them back to the lenders. But what if nobody wants to sell? Looks like that's another video as well. And what if the short seller goes out of business? What happens then? Well, look, it looks like GameStop is the gift that keeps on giving, and that's going to be another video. I hope that this helped you understand the mechanics behind how GameStop can get to 140% of the public float short sold. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing to my channel and maybe leave a comment to tell me what you think about the video. And of course, ring the bell so you don't miss any more videos in this series or others that I might bring. Thanks, and I look forward to catching you next time.